stand with me. We're going to continue our series this morning on signs as we've been thinking about uh, what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 24. And guys, can, we, can you bring up Matthew 24 verses? Can we start at verse uh, 4 and go down through verse 8 in just a second? That'd be great. I'm going to read this for you. This, this really, the, this series is kind of born out of a time when I was praying and asking the Lord what to do next, what, what would you like me to say? And uh, the particular verse is actually in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. That verse talks about the men of the tribe of Issachar and how they understood the times in which they lived and they knew what to do. Now, what, what does that mean? They understood what God was doing at that time in the people of God in Israel, and they knew that they should come under the leadership of David as king. That's what that meant. So the question I have for us is, do we understand what God is doing in our times, and are we coming under the leadership of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, right, according to the scriptures? Uh, and so that's the, the way, uh, that's the mindset in which I approach this series. How should we respond to what God's doing in the world? How do we know how to respond, how we know what he's doing, and how do we know how to respond? Jesus began to answer the disciples' question in Matthew 24 when they were talking about how beautiful the temple was, and Jesus says, well, one of these days it's going to be destroyed. And uh, they said, oh, well, when is all that going to happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of this age. From their understanding, what they meant was, when will you fully take over as the king and Messiah reigning in Jerusalem from Israel and make everything right? And so Jesus answers that question beginning in verse four. Look at what he says. He says, first of all, watch out that no one deceives you. First thing out of his mouth. You know what the signs of the time are? Watch out that no one deceives you. Because there are going to be many false messiahs, many people claiming to be Messiah, and notice they will deceive many people. Last week, we talked about this reality. For you and I to avoid deception, we have to be filled with the truth. We have to know the truth of the scripture and be saturated with it. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to make sure you, you catch that message. He goes on in verse Number six to say, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that, uh, see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. In Luke's gospel, he tells us that Jesus also added the word pestilence, which we could translate as pandemic. That's the idea. It's worldwide disease and problems. So as time goes by, Jesus says these things will happen. And look at verse 8, a key verse in this section. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. And as I said last week, birth pains don't happen all at once. They come uh, they increase in frequency and intensity up until the birth and then their celebration. And that's what Jesus is saying. These signs will happen. They'll increase in frequency and intensity until it's time. And then Jesus will come and there'll be great celebration to those of us who are waiting and looking and longing for you. Are you with me this morning? We want to study that together. Would you pray with me? And if you are willing, would you repeat this prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God, the Bible. Thank you for its absolute truth. I pray that you would give me a mind to understand it, a heart to receive it, and a will to obey it. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you can be seated. God bless you. Well, I don't think there's uh, any word that most describes the messaging that comes through the media these days. I think there's one word that describes it probably best for me, and that's the word fear. The media is constantly, by the way they 
share the news by the commercials that happen in between. Have you ever seen some of those commercials on some of those medicines? They scare you to death, making you think you need to take the medicine. And then if you listen carefully, they give you the tagline, which makes you more afraid of the medicine than it is the disease that you've got. Are you with me so far? Fear, 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 fear. Exaggerating, highlighting, pushing, spinning, promoting fear. And don't get me wrong. There are fearful things happening. And that's the point that Jesus was making here as he talked to disciples. He said one of the signs that are going to increase there will be fear-producing events that are happening in the world. Just last night, I noticed that there was a volcano that erupted under the sea out in the Pacific, and they gave a warning to the West Coast of potential tsunami to come. Perhaps you saw that. These kinds of things are going to increase and continue on, and the media constantly talks about them and promotes anxiety and worry and fear and how it reports things. Again, don't get me wrong. I know there are real issues. I know there are real problems. We're not uh, minimizing the pain, the hurt of loss, or people who've died from COVID, or the tornado in Kentucky, or all that. I know. I get it. All I'm saying is that the media tends to sometimes, oftentimes, magnify things and make everybody more worried and scared about what's going on. My sister lives in New Mexico. She frequently calls me and says, are you okay out there? I'm like, yeah, why? What's the problem? Well, I saw in the news where, you know, you know, in some storm, they made it sound like all of Philadelphia was wiped out. Are you with me? There are real things happening in the world. I've had COVID and it wasn't fun. I know Ron and Beth have had COVID. I know there's in church. It's not fun. We get sick. And the Lord's wills, we get over it. And if not, we step into eternity in the presence of Jesus. Because to die is gain for the person who's following Christ. But in this text, in spite of the fearful events, what Jesus said to disciples was, the whole point of this entire section can be wrapped up in this word, preparation. Prepare. We talked about it last week. Prepare for the Lord. Don't speculate about it. Prepare for it. It's going to happen. And so we're to prepare. And one of the ways we prepare for the Lord in terms of all of the fearful things that are happening in life is recorded for us in that one phrase. Jesus actually gave us a command here. If you're a follower of Jesus, here's a command that the Lord has given you. When you start seeing all these fearful things happening, see to it that you are not alarmed. Make sure you're not afraid. In fact, in the New Living Translation, it says, when you see these things happen, don't panic. Listen, the world around you panicked when COVID first happened. There's great panic and fear and worry and anxiety. And Jesus says to us, if you're a follower of Christ, you shouldn't be panicking like the world. You should be living fearless lives. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to panic and anxiety that characterize the pagan culture. You're a child of God. You're not in the dark that you don't know what's going on. And you know the person who holds your future. I know whom I have believed in, Paul says. And I'm convinced he's able to guard what I've committed to him. And what have I committed to him? My life. He's able to guard my life until the time he comes back. Now, having said that, let me say. If you haven't trusted Jesus yet, if you haven't given your life to Christ, if you're here in the room or watching online this morning, you've not trusted Christ, honestly, you have a lot of reason to be afraid. You have a lot of reason to be afraid. Because the Bible simply tells us that now, today, is the day of salvation. Today's the day to get saved. When Jesus returns... Very few people will turn to the Lord and be saved. Most will not. And for those who do, they will more than likely be martyred very quickly by the Antichrist. So today's the day of salvation. When Jesus comes back the second time, he's not coming to bring salvation. He's coming to bring judgment. And so... You have a reason to fear if you don't know the Lord. And I'm not saying that to try to guilt you or manipulate you. I'm just saying this is just reality. 
Those of us who are following Christ have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear because we are hidden with Christ in God. The death angel has passed over us. I'll use an Old Testament picture. We have put the blood of Jesus Christ. We believed in Jesus and the blood of Christ has covered us so that the death angel, the second death, the eternal death, he passes over us and we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. I want to talk a little bit more about this this morning and talk about overcoming fear. But just, again, think about this. The Lord has repeatedly commanded us not to be afraid. In Joshua, when Joshua was taking leadership, he told Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. When uh, in Psalm 37, the scripture says, don't worry. It just leads to evil. Have you ever noticed how when you get all worried, you start turning to evil and trying to control things and maybe trying to make escapes into some sort of sinful attitude? Anybody out there this morning? Don't worry, it just leads to evil. He says in Isaiah 41.10, what a great verse. You need to memorize this verse if you don't know it because all of God's promises apply to us. He said to the nation of Israel, he said, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right. Notice that. I will uphold you. In Isaiah 43, he said it like this. He said, don't be a fear. Don't uh, be, uh, don't not fear. I've redeemed you, your mind. And when you pass through the fire, you won't be burned. When the, when the flood comes, you won't be overwhelmed. Why? Because I'm going to uphold you. There is a sustaining grace in the power of the Holy Spirit who sustains and empowers and helps us to endure the problems of life with hope because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. So we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in Isaiah 44, don't tremble, don't be afraid. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't worry about your life. I know what you need. He said in that same text in verse 30, don't worry about tomorrow, I'll take care of it. And then in John chapter 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not like the world gives. The world has to have everything comfortable and easy and no problems and and they gotta have an amount of money in the bank and they gotta have all the things going just like they want it to be at peace. Not, Not you, Jesus said. Now, you can be facing all of these fearful problems. The economy could, could drop out, and uh, you could have all kinds of other issues, but you can still have peace if you're trusting in me. You see, there is peace for those who follow Christ. In fact, in 2 Timothy, here's the last one. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Just think on that for a minute. God's not given you a spirit of fear. Now notice, first of all, it's a spirit and God didn't give it to you. Are you with me? So where does it come from? Well, part of it is just the natural human response. Can we just be honest this morning? All of us, even followers of Jesus, we feel fear at times. There are times when I feel afraid. There are times when I have thoughts of worry or anxiety that come to me. It's part of the natural human response to threatening situations. Amen? But guess what? On top of that, we have a spiritual enemy that that emanates, that, that impacts our minds and our hearts with a spiritual energy that wants to inspire and magnify the fear that, that is in our hearts. He wants to get our minds off of the Lord and on to all the stuff that, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? Well, what if it doesn't? But he doesn't say that. No, he packs us with all kinds of thoughts and fears and ideas, trying to control our thoughts and feelings. We all experience fear, but here's what Jesus is saying. We don't have to, nor should we, surrender to or live in a state of fear, a state of mind and heart of fear because of our relationship with Christ. The enemy will try his best 
to fight us on this. He will try to bring these things to us. And what I'm saying is, and what I'll say again later, is that we, listen, you cannot be passive in your spiritual life. You can't be passive in walking and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, you are not a toddler in a spiritual daycare. You're a warrior on a spiritual battlefield. Are you with me this morning? You're not a toddler. God's not going to, you know, God didn't call you to follow him to, to cuddle you and change your diaper and, and you know, stick a bottle in your mouth. No, he called you to make you in the image of Jesus Christ, to be his ambassador, his agent in this, in this world. Are you following with me? You're tracking with me this morning. We are, we are warriors on a spiritual battlefield. If you're passive, there's no way you're going to make it. You're going to be afraid. And you're going to succumb to fear. Why? Because you're not being active. So, okay. So what do we do then? If I'm supposed to trust the Lord and not be afraid, how do I go about doing that? Well, let's just start with an honest thing. Number one, you and I have got to turn away from any known sin in our life. Can we just start there with an honesty? You know how it works. You know good and well that if you're doing something as a follower of Christ that you know you shouldn't be doing, you're involved in some relationship, you're watching some movie, you're posting something or looking at something in social media, you're saying something that you shouldn't be saying, you know your own conscience bothers you, and if you're perpetually living in some sort of disobedience, if you're watching pornography, you're constantly gambling. You're constantly lying, making stuff up. Your conscience not only bothers you, the Holy Spirit who lives within you is grieved and he convicts and he reminds you of who you are. And then when something, some problem comes along, some pandemic or some earthquake or some e economic problem, what happens? You have no confidence whatsoever. Why? Because you know you haven't been living right. And so your faith is shaken and you end up being fearful. Why? First John chapter four, verse 18 tells us. It says there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. The context is we love because God loves us. In other words, what he's saying in this text is when you and I fully understand how much God loves us, when we really live in the love that God has for us, we are secure in that love. We love him in response. In this text, he says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. You're going to be walking in the light, in the truth, as much as you can. And as you do that, he says, you're going to, you're going to be secure. Now, when a problem comes along, your heart's not condemning you, and you're not all upset and worried about maybe the Lord's punishing you because of something you did wrong. Are you out there this morning listening to me? So as we follow the Lord with wholehearted honesty and surrender and confession and we're doing our best to love the Lord, how many of you know you sin every day even when you don't realize it? You and I are more sinful than we even begin to understand in the eyes and mind of God. There's a big difference between that and doing something you know you should not be doing. Are you, are you with me? Thinking something, speaking something conjuring things up in your mind, using your imagination for evil instead of using your imagination to picture what the scripture says. Oh, the imagination's a wonderful thing given us by the Lord to do what? To imagine his glory, to imagine the throne of God, to imagine him high and lifted up and seated at the right end of the Father. What if you used your imagination for that? You see, you and I have to understand that just to be at rest in the presence of the Lord, we need to be walking in the truth. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, this is the message that we've heard from Jesus and declare to you. God is light, that is, he is truth, and he is righteous, and he's holy. And in him there is no darkness, there's no sin, there's no evil, there's no wickedness in God at all. If we claim to have fellowship with the Lord, and yet we're walking, we're living in sin, darkness, then we lie and we do not live the truth. 
But if we walk in the truth, in the light, if we're doing our best to do what is right, depending on the Lord, confessing our sin, he says, if we walk in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all unrighteousness. And we can set our hearts at rest when our hearts condemn us, he says in chapter 3. Why can we set our hearts at rest? Because to the best of our ability, we're, we're doing what we ought to do. We're trusting the Lord. We're believing him. We're, we're confessing our sins and resting in his love for us. And because we are walking in fellowship, because we're in fellowship with God, we have confidence. And as we walk in fellowship, we're able to stay in confidence. How are you going to overcome fear in your life? How many of you realize this morning I'm just talking to you? Are you, are you with me? Once in a while, as your pastor, I think I just need to talk to you. You okay with that? Listen, you can't live in willful disobedience and be at peace. You just can't do it. And you certainly will succumb to fear. So that's number one. Now, I'll, I'll try to go faster, I promise. <laughs> Lord help me. Number two, the second thing we need to do is to direct our thoughts and put our trust. You have to put your trust. You have to direct your thoughts. We have to intentionally choose what we will focus on and direct our thoughts to the Lord and to the truth. Don't allow your thoughts to be directed. Don't allow yourself to meditate on the problems, the what ifs, the possibilities of harm. Choose not to dwell on those things. Direct your thoughts away from those things. See to it, he says here. This is the key word in this text. The word see to it is one word in the Greek language, and it it's literally means just to see, but the way it was used, it emphasized more than just seeing something with your eyes. It emphasized the idea of discerning with understanding and looking beyond, of seeing more than what you could actually see. See to it, Jesus says, that you're not alarmed because these things have to happen. And so you're going to look beyond. You're going to see more. You're going to look to the sovereign Lord who is behind them, working all things together according to his plan, both for your life and for the world. See to it. Look beyond. Did you ever have one of those cameras where you look through the lens and if you focused on something close, everything farther away was fuzzy, right? And if you focused on something far away, everything up close was fuzzy. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is exactly what this word is telling us. Jesus is saying, when you begin to see these fearful events right here, focus your eyes beyond them to the Lord who is behind them. And all these things begin to look differently. The old chorus said it like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. That's what he's telling us here. We've got to look beyond to see the sovereign Lord behind all things. Did you ever watch the old movie, uh, Wizard of the Oz? Anybody ever watch that? I don't recommend that movie. Scared the daylights out of me when I was a little kid. Those flying monkeys got me. I don't know. It was... You remember they're all scared to death until they get in, they get in the room where the, where the wizard is and they're all just shaking and trembling right up until the dog pulls the curtain back. And then they see it's just this old guy with a machine. Are you with me? And then they're not afraid anymore. What Jesus is telling us is let the Holy Spirit reveal to you to pull back the curtains and let you see the glorified Lord in his majesty who is controlling all things and how he is working and then you will be able to direct your thoughts toward him, to see to it that you're getting your mind on him. Things are not out of control. We don't have to fear harm or death. Our heavenly father is working all things exactly out as he told us he would, both in the world and in our individual lives. We have to believe what the scripture says. And you know one of the things it says? I know we don't like to think about this. We, we don't like to think about this. We don't like to talk about this. You know what the Bible says about the day of your death? It says that it is strategically planned by the Lord. 
If you're trusting Christ, you're living for him and following him. If you don't do something stupid like Judas did, God's got a day planned for you. Say, where do you see that, Pastor? In Psalm 116 in verse 15, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Is the Bible telling us that God's up in heaven saying, oh, I just can't wait for them to die. It's going to be so fun. No, that's not what it's saying. This word precious means valuable. From God's perspective and his plan that all the days ordained for me are written in his book before one of them come to be. And I am invincible until Jesus says otherwise. And as I follow the Lord Jesus Christ, my death will be valuable to God. He will use my death at a strategic time in a strategic place to accomplish his strategic will, both for his glory and for my fulfillment, because my purpose in life is to glorify God. And as I die in the Lord, I will step into his presence and he will use that death for the glory and honor of his name and I will receive great fulfillment because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, hallelujah. That's the truth. That's why we're not afraid. Death is simply stepping into the presence of Jesus whom we worship. Oh, I know it is fearful. I know we don't understand it all, but all if we'll direct our thoughts. You remember in John 21, Jesus told Peter, He said, when you know when you're older, someone else is going to take you where you don't want to go. You're young, you go where you want, but Peter, when you get old, they're going to take you where you don't want to go. And the Bible says, Jesus said said this to him, quote, to share with him the reality of how the Lord had planned for him to die. We need to direct our thoughts to the Lord. We're not toddlers, we're battlers in the kingdom. And so what do we direct our thoughts to? We direct our thoughts intentionally to the love of God in Christ on the cross for us. Have you thought lately about how Jesus was beaten for you? Have you pictured in your mind and used your imagination to stand with Mary at the foot of the cross? You can do that, you know. You have a wonderful gift from the Lord to stand and look up at Jesus hanging on the cross for you, crying out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it is finished, it's completed. Have you thought about it? Why not think about it? Direct your thoughts intentionally to the love of God in Christ Jesus, that you cannot be separated from his love. Intentionally think about God's presence. Do you realize Jesus is present right now in this room with you all the time? There's never anywhere we go that God isn't present. We don't always remember he's present. It would be a good idea for us to remind ourselves, the Lord's with me right now, especially when that guy cuts me off in the traffic, man, oh man. Intentionally think about God's promises. The Bible says all of God's promises are yours in Christ. You need to think about those promises. Look up some promises. Isaiah 41.10, memorize it. Think on it when you're facing. When you're facing those difficulties and challenges, intentionally focus your thoughts on the promises of God who Christ died to give you. I will Uh, protect you. I will take you through the fire. I will not let you be over. Oh, come on. Claim the word of God. Choose to believe. When we intentionally choose our thoughts and when we begin to direct our thoughts to these truths and really meditate on them rather than allowing them to be directed by the media or demonic forces behind the world's message, we begin to put our trust in Jesus, knowing that nothing separates us from his love, nothing separates us from his promises, his presence, his power, his protective grace, and the future glory that he has for us. And he will empower us to endure all that he allows us to go through as we depend on him. He will empower us to endure. That's why Stephen could, while he was being stoned to death, Stephen could look up to heaven with a glow on his face and say, I see the Lord 
Lord, seated at the right hand of the Father. Father, forgive them. They don't know it. Oh, how does a man do that? I don't know about you. I hope not to be stoned to death. But if I have to face that day, if I face a sword, what I know is this, that Jesus will be with me and that Jesus by his spirit will empower me and that Jesus will give me the strength to endure. I don't have it on my own, but as I trust in Christ, he lives within me to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I ask or think. And if I will learn to trust him in these little trials I'm facing. Oh, see, that's the deal. We haven't had to give our lives for Jesus yet. We can't even trust him when we get frustrated because we lost our cell phone. Anybody want to say amen? Are you hearing me? If we can't trust the Lord, if we can't, listen, let perseverance have its work, James 1, 2. If we can't do that in the little problems, the relational conflicts, the, the frustrations when things don't go the way we want or we don't get what, if we can't trust God now, and why does God let us do that? To prepare us for the greater thing. And so we begin to direct our thoughts. Are you with me this morning? I know I've talked too long, so let me try to hurry. Uh, John chapter 14, Jesus said it like this. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Don't, Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust. What do I do instead of worry? Trust. Trust is a choice. It's intentional. You walked in this morning and you put all of your trust in a chair. Some of you, the same chair you sit in every single time you come to this church. You just plopped down on that chair. You never once gave a thought or worried about whether or not it would hold you up. Can I get an amen? You know, we could have taken a hacksaw and, you know, sawed those so that when you sat down, boom, you would collapse. Now, how many of you are going to check next week when you sit down? <laughs> no, you, know, you gave it no thought. Why? Because you've sat in that chair so many times. You know how uncomfortable it gets when the pastor preaches too long. And so you know. Listen, pay attention. Reject the thoughts of the media and of the satanic forces that assail your mind. Replace them with the thoughts of God's word. Direct your thoughts. You cannot be passive. You cannot be passive. You cannot be passive in your spiritual life. If you're passive, you will be defeated. You must take up the sword of the spirit. You must take up the shield of faith and actually use them against the enemy. I'm going to quit quickly. Number one, we praise and pray with thanksgiving. You know these verses, Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Don't be anxious with prayer and petition. Raise your request to the Lord and what will happen? He will give you the peace of God that doesn't make any sense. You shouldn't have peace. It'll pass understanding, but you'll have it because you're keeping your thoughts on the Lord. You're, you're praying and pouring your heart out, but you're doing it with thanksgiving. You're, you're keeping your mind on the Lord, not on the problem. And then he says, go ahead then and just think about things that you should think about, verse 8, and practice what you should practice, verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. So rejoice in the Lord, request his help, and keep your focus on the Lord. As I reviewed that passage again this week, I'm trying to hurry to quit. Um, I couldn't help but remember the story of Jacob. Anybody remember Jacob and Esau? Jacob lied deceived his father and uh, took the blessing of his brother. He was a mama's boy for the most part. Uh, Esau was the hunter, the rugged guy. And the Bible says that after running away because Esau hated Jacob and said, I'm killing this dude. As soon as dad is gone, I'm taking, I'm going to kill my brother. He deserves it. And so Jacob's mom sends him away. He runs away. 
The Bible says after years of serving, he makes his way back toward uh, the land, back toward his brother. And as he's going to meet his brother, the Bible says that Jacob met the angel of the Lord and he wrestled with him all night long and refused to let go until the Lord blessed him. And in that wrestling match with the Lord, Jacob was crippled. The Lord touched his hip. And I can just tell you that there is no substitute for getting alone with God somewhere with that, that painful thing that you face, that painful relationship, that painful circumstance that you have to endure. Listen to me. If you turn to sin, it just make it worse. Oh, I know you think you'll escape. You won't. You just repeat the error. There's no substitute for getting alone with God and wrestling with him in prayer and praise and saying, Lord, I'm not letting go until you bless me. And he'll cripple you. He'll cripple your pride. He'll cripple your self-independence. And he'll bring you into the sweet place of true humility and surrender where there is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, whatever problem you're facing. No substitute for wrestling with God. Make sure you wrestle with him. Number four, you got to keep gathering with the people of God. I'll read it and move quickly. Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who has promised is faithful and let us consider how to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Direct command of the word of the Lord. As you see the day approaching, don't stop meeting together. But encourage each other more. In fact, as you see the day approaching, he says, meet together even more. Why? Because we are wired for community. We're not wired to do this alone. We're designed for community to be part of the family of God. That's why we have life groups. We put on our happy face and come to church, but oh, we must have relationships and friendships where we can talk and share and listen and pray and help and serve each other and support each other and be together. We need deep friendships. Oh, I got that in my family. No, if all you've got your family, this is how you see life right here. But when you get into a group and you begin to mix with the people of God from somebody from the other side of the world, Somebody with a very different perspective, family background. Oh, your eyes begin to open up and you go, wow, God is a big, wonderful God. Get in the life group. Commit to it. Learn how to talk and share and listen. Oh, I know people aren't perfect. Neither are you. Enjoy being with people. Learn how to do that. We're designed for fellowship. And finally, okay, I'm quitting. Use wisdom and common sense, but don't stop serving. Wear a mask. Use hand sanitizer. Do whatever you think will help you. You're, you're meeting, you don't come to church because uh, of legitimate illnesses and you know that you need to stay home. Or maybe, quite frankly, let's be honest, you're just afraid. Is there someone you're not afraid of? Why don't you invite them over to your house? Engage, participate. If you're watching online, I would encourage you, don't just sit there on Sunday morning eating your Pop-Tart. Get up out of the easy chair when we're worshiping. Invite somebody over. Invite two or three people. Let that be a gathering in your house and lift your hands and sing out loud and pray and worship just like you're in this room. We love that you're there. We'd love for you to do that. 
Man, we could gather in coffee shops or homes or clubhouses or, or wherever the Lord opens the door and we can worship. Why? Because God has given us this wonderful tool of technology. We can gather together even though we're not all in the same place. But oh, there's got to be community to share and be together, not just be cloistered, circled the wagons in our own little protective bubble. Now keep serving, keep gathering, keep doing what God's called you to do. Matthew chapter 24, verse 45, Jesus said, who is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his servants in his household to give them their food at their proper time? That's who you are. You're the servant who's been in charge of God's household, his kingdom, to give those who are outside the kingdom their food, their, the gospel, the peace of Christ, the goodness of God. That's you. He says, blessed is that servant. It'll be good for that servant who is doing that when I return. Not the one who circled the wagons trying to protect himself from every single problem in life. It's impossible. I'm pretty convinced at this point I'd almost be willing to bet there are some people who have stayed home the whole time and still got COVID. I could be wrong. Well, the conclusion is simply this. Last week, we said it was preparation, not speculation. And this week, the point is, it's participation, not isolation. That's what prepares us for the return of the Lord. Listen, don't allow the fearful events happening in the world today to keep you isolated and separated from the people of God or from the work of God. Use wisdom and trust God. Use wisdom and trust God. And then trust that your life is in his hands. We don't have to give in to fear. We can turn from sin direct our thoughts, praise and pray with thanksgiving, keep gathering with the people of God to encourage each other, and we can continue serving the Lord using wisdom and common sense, knowing that our life is in his hands. So church, listen to the words of Jesus. See to it that you are not alarmed. These things must happen. Amen. Well, that wraps up this message today. Hey, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel. The best way to stay connected is by hitting that subscribe button. We hope that you were inspired and encouraged through this message and take a next step in your faith today. We believe this, the best is yet to come.